Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Governor John Carney. Thank you for joining us for our weekly press conference on Delaware's response to COVID-19, our most recent series of, of updates. I'm joined today by a, a new team, uh, Molly McGarrick, who's the Secretary of Health and Social Services. She's been with us before, but new to our team is Dr. Mark Holodick, who's the new Secretary of Education. Dr. Holodick has a, a long career in education in our state, both ends of the state, frankly, Dr. Holodick in the Brandywine School District, uh, where he grew up and went to, to public schools and at Del Mar, uh, where he spent some time in the Del Mar School District. I don't think he can get cover as much territory in Delaware as, as that. I don't know anybody who's done that. And of course, a long stint uh, as the superintendent of the Brandywine School District. And we're really delighted and excited to have you on our team, you've hit the ground running. Uh, we were, and I think you were very instrumental in helping us get approval from the Brandywine and Red Clay School Districts of our Wilmington Learning Collaborative, one of our highest priorities. I know important to you and, and citizens of Wilmington and our state to make sure our Wilmington children do as, as well as they can and have the tools they need to be successful in life. We also have Pam, our sign language expert for the deaf and hard of hearing. We appreciate her being with us as she is uh, most weeks. Thank you, Pam, uh, for your work with us. So we've got uh, some good news and we'll go, go right to the data dashboard. Really some good news this week in terms of the, the data that we watch and report on on a weekly basis. Our new positive cases on a seven day moving average is down to 305. You'll remember that just a few weeks ago, at the uh, beginning of the month, we were at 3,000, over 3,000 cases per day on a seven-day moving average. So significant improvement there. To give you some context there, last year, after the December surge, which was the previous high in terms of hospitalizations, we were at 343. So better this year still at 305. Still higher than we want it to be. We want it to be 100 or fewer, which we've we've uh, hit at certain periods during the pandemic. 8.8% uh, .8 positive tests, meaning the number of tests that are administered, how many are positive. Uh, we want that number to be uh, below 5%. We've been there before. We've been as low as 1% or less in, in the summertime, the warm uh, warmer months and days of the year. And then importantly, the, the number that I look at uh, the closest and that we really focus on is the, the number of Delawareans that are hospitalized uh, for uh, COVID-19 up to 190. We, I say up to because we're steadily moving down from 70, 759, which was the peak on January the 12th, significantly above, uh, by the way, last year's peak at 474 on exactly the same day, January 12th. We had, uh, we had a couple of days ago, we were down to 175 and now ticking up a little bit uh, to 190. We do get some of that over the weekends at times in terms of folks that are tested after being admitted, but steadily moving down at 190 from 759. Last year, to give you some context again, on this date last year, on yesterday uh, last year, 200. So 190 compared to 200 last year. Sadly, we still lose people. Uh, we're up to 2,645 Delawareans who've died uh, because of COVID. Sadly, everyone a precious life. And the, the risk uh, that COVID has to particularly our elderly citizens of hospitalization and of death is one of the things that motivates the decision making that we make and have made over the last uh, two years. So let's look at the the uh, the ride there again in uh, hospitalizations, the peaks and valleys, somewhat predictable now. We see significant increases in peaks during the uh, the December holidays, the New Year. Uh, people getting together, gathering in social environments, letting their guard down a little bit, if as you will, if you will. Summer times much better than that. The first summer. Uh, of 2021 and then uh, for summer 220 and then 221, our numbers went down, you know, below almost below 10. 474 at the peak last year, January 12th, and 759 this year. 
190 a day, and that's what drives us to, uh, frankly, suspend the need for these press conferences. That's the best news, I think, for most of you, that we don't have to have those to give folks a, an update on our progress. We do that to communicate what we need to do uh, to stem the tide of increasing cases, what we need to do to protect uh, our senior citizens, what we need to do in public spaces to, to protect one another. And so after today's press conference, we'll suspend them for the time being and really uh, hunker down and focusing on getting more Delawareans vaccinated and those that are fully vaccinated boosted. You'll see those numbers in a minute. Here's our vaccine update uh, to total so far. We've delivered over 1.7 million of vaccines to Delawareans across our state. Uh, almost 70% uh, of Delawareans fully vaccinated. That's the total population, including the children five years and under who aren't, aren't eligible. And then you can see the numbers there below of the eligible populations five years and above at 71%, 12 years and above 75%, fully vaccinated that is, and 18 years and above 77% fully vaccinated. And those of us who are 65 and older, uh, we know the risk to ourselves, and we're therefore 94% uh, fully vaccinated, and it's still a significant amount, uh, a significant number of those 65 and older who are boosted. I'll show those numbers in a minute. We still are waiting for emergency youth authorization for children five years and under. I understand that's been delayed a bit, but we're eager to have that. I, I know parents are eager to have that opportunity as well. One of the areas that we're really gonna start focusing on now, uh, as we've kind of beat the winter surge here, is to make sure that folks get uh, boosted. On our White House call this morning, Dr. Walensky, Dr. Fauci mentioned how much additional protection is provided if you get fully vaccinated and the booster. Uh, 90 some plus percent of those who have, uh, those who've died with COVID were not vaccinated or boosted. And so that's a really important thing, particularly those who are vulnerable populations. You can see we're not even to 50% for those 12 and under fully vaccinated plus a booster or those 18 and over, I'm sorry, 12 and over and 18 and over 46%. As you get up to, again, my age cohort, uh, 65 and older, older uh, two thirds of us are, are vaccinated. And that's the national average according to uh, the White House call this morning. And so we need to really lean into making sure that every eligible Delawarean gets fully vaccinated, gets boosted, so they have a full protection. We did announce uh, that the state of Delaware indoor mask requirement uh, would end on February 11th, as it did. Businesses and employers may have their own policies. I noticed as I went into my Wawa this morning, that they had a sign on the door that uh, recommended use of, of, uh, of uh, masks in their, their facilities. I will continue to wear my mask there as I enter to get my coffee each day. So look out, look for those notices, respect uh, the rights of employers to uh, impose those uh, requirements. Mostly it is to protect their employees. Every employer that I talk to across our state these days is challenged to fill the vacancies have, challenged to um, keep their operations going uh, because the, they're experiencing difficulty finding workers. No matter what you do, we, we're experiencing in our schools, we're experiencing in our youth detention centers, nursing facilities, long-term care facilities, Secretary McGarrick, you name it, we are challenged at the state level. We have a additional pay policy to help attract of folks to state employment, and I know every employer across the board is experiencing that. So if, if you have an employer with a public space that you, that you utilize on a regular basis, please respect uh, their indoor mask requirements as well. We will continue to have a mask requirements in state buildings. They're required by federal regulations in healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities where we know our most vulnerable populations are folks that are uh, in the latter part of their lives uh, in long-term care facilities, and of course on public 
transportation. Those are federal requirements and they will remain in, in effect uh, in Delaware as well. Mask requirements in schools and childcare at the state level will remain in, in effect through the month of March. Secretary Haldick is going to be talking about in a minute about his work with the superintendents and the local school boards to determine uh, the best way to uh, manage uh, COVID-19 in their schools um, after March 31st, whether they, whether and when they need mass requirements, uh, what kind of social distancing, what kind of quarantine uh, levels, and we'll be working on a uh, new set of, of guidances there. I think that one of the points that was made on our White House call this morning uh, in response to governors from across the nation, Democrat and Republican, was the need to look forward, uh, the need to anticipate what might happen uh, down the road, to work together that the federal government will be providing uh, policy recommendations at the national level, and that state governments and local governments, local school boards, have to implement those, uh, those guidances at the local level. And each of, the, each of the states is in a little bit different place, both in terms of the percentage of their population that's vaccinated, fully vaccinated, boosted, uh, as it relates to the spread of the virus, the number of hospitalizations that they have, uh, everyone's a little bit different. And that was a big part of our a call with the White House uh, this morning. We've had some really incredible school vaccination events. And in, in, in fact, as I look across the states, and we do this a lot, but the states that are, are more effective have higher vaccination rates, particularly for their younger children, those that are eligible, uh, five years old and older, where we find the, the highest rates are in areas where their schools are really actively involved. We saw that ourselves with our partnership with pharmacies to vaccinate teachers and school personnel. And I think we're certainly seeing that. So thank you to our partners. We have some, some photographs of success there. East Dover Elementary, you can see the, there the healthcare professionals providing vaccinations for the children. North Dover Elementary, there's the team there providing uh, COVID-19 vac vaccines there on site. And then Polytech uh, uh, High School there, in uh, Kent County, a real shout out to them. I understand that they have among the highest vaccination rate in, uh, of our high schools in our state. So kudos, kudos to them, kudos to the team that makes that happen. It's not one person, it's certainly a team of folks. So kudos to those at, uh, at Polytech. Also Cape Henlopen here in one of the more highly vaccinated areas of our state, kudos to the Rehoboth Lewis general area. They have probably the highest uh, vaccination rates in our state. So we appreciate the cooperation and the teams of, of uh, vaccinators, of school personnel, school nurses. Our school nurses have been unbelievable. You know, they've had a real burden placed on them and we appreciate their tremendous work. So one of the areas where we're gonna focus on over the next several weeks and months is the booster, making sure everybody gets that booster shot after they've been fully vaccinated, so critically important. Uh, so thanks again to, to all our teams. I should uh, real quickly, uh, quick shout out to our Army and Air National Guard. Those men and women have really come up big, working in our hospitals and non-clinical roles, getting trained up to work in our, in our long-term care facilities to enable the hospitals to discharge patients our hospitalization number has gone from 759 to under 200, in large part because of that uh, partnership among our National Guard men and women, Army and Air, and, and the hospitals as they and our long-term care facilities as they as they've opened up space, providing uh, needed uh, employees to to so that the hospitals can discharge those patients outside the hospital where they don't need that kind of uh, critical care into our long-term care facilities. Lastly, it is Black History Month. I do want to mention a forum that we're having sponsored by the Delaware Heritage Commission and its co-chair, Dr. Reba Hollingsworth, just a real gem, a real a prize member of the Delaware community, 94 or five years young, 
uh, and still going strong. She and Dr. Bradley Skelcher, a professor emeritus at DSU, will be uh, participating in a forum on racial history and education in our state. That's February 23rd at 6.30 p.m. de.gov slash live. Next up, we have Secretary uh, McGarrick, who's going to bring us an update on vaccination boosters and our focus on getting our children, our young adults, our seniors, and everybody who needs to be vaccinated and boosted in our state, particular focus on uh, pediatric vac vaccinations, which are so critically important to the children and their parents. Secretary McGarrick. Thank you, Governor. I'm happy to be with everyone today. And I want to thank you and echo the praise that you offered, Governor, to the schools that are doing many vaccination events. And you talked about a couple of them. And we know that these events are happening across the state. And again, as, as you pointed out, but I really think we need to continue to emphasize the states and the communities with the highest pediatric vaccination rates, we see these very important partnerships in school-sponsored and school promoted events. So again, we're just so excited to see those continue to happen across our state. And it's frankly one of the reasons why the school mask mandate uh, is, is set to expire later in March uh, versus sooner, is we really want to give parents, caregivers, the opportunity to get their kids vaccinated. Um, and again, now with the end of the mask mandate approaching, Maybe parents who were on the fence who said, well, you know, we, we have this protection with the masking. I'm going to wait and continue to watch uh, the rollout of pediatric vaccines. Uh, again, the safety data is clear. And with the mask mandate ending, this is really the perfect time. And we do urge everyone um, whose children have not yet been vaccinated uh, to please do so. There's a number of opportunities, again, in schools and community settings, pediatricians offices across the state. Um, and so currently, um, we, we have work to do. Our vaccination rate amongst youth is lower um, than we'd like it to be. Uh, the, the over five population was the most recent group to be approved, but they've been approved since the fall. Um, and so again, with the masks in place, it's maybe uh, not as critical. I mean, we would argue it's very critical, but you know, again, we can understand why maybe people say, eh, I don't need to vaccinate right now, uh, but the vaccines continue to be the most effective way to prevent a serious illness, hospitalization, and unfortunately, uh, God forbid, uh, death. And so at last week's briefing, Dr. Rite pointed out this slide and again, we two years into the pandemic, we want to celebrate all of our wins, even small ones. Um, but we do continue to see these numbers tick up. And again, we hope that accelerates um, as we get closer and continue to move towards uh, the expiration of the mask, uh, statewide mask mandate. Um, so for ages 5 to 11, 31% have received one dose and 24% are fully vaccinated, which is up from 22% last week. I'm happy to include uh, both of my kids in that cohort of uh, being fully vaccinated. And for ages 12 plus, um, approaching two thirds that have had one dose um, and over half have been fully vaccinated. And again, we are seeing gains there, uh, which we wanna celebrate, but again, still uh, room for improvement. Next slide. And uh, to orient you to this map, uh, this shows the pediatric vaccination rates, uh, a heat map for counties uh, and zip codes uh, for kids five and up. And we continue to see Newcastle County outperforming Kent and Sussex County when it comes to this age group getting vaccinated. Um, and again, statewide, we do see this vaccination rate increasing. Uh, but we have 25 zip codes that are lagging substantially behind the statewide average. Uh, we see them more than 10 points behind to be exact. And unfortunately, we have eight zip codes that the overall vaccination rate is under 10%. So again, these are areas where we have concern and we have more work to do because uh, the children who are not vaccinated are at an increased risk of infections, hospitalizations, and potentially serious or long-term outcomes from their COVID infection uh, if they are to get infected. Next slide. 
Uh, so this is a similar heat map. This time we're talking about kids in the uh, age cohort of 12 to 17. And again, we see the, the geographic distribution where some parts of uh, some of our communities are doing really well. And we have some communities that are lagging behind uh, Western Kent County, uh, Western Sussex County. Again, we're seeing a substantial lag behind the state average. Um, so we really, again, want to lean into this work and continue to work with community partners, continue to help people not only have access to the vaccine, but feel comfortable with their, with their children being vaccinated. Um, and in this 12 to 17 cohort, they've been eligible since the summer. Um, so again, that this group, we've had a lot of, we're having almost a year's worth of experience. The vaccines are safe. They've kept kids out of the hospital. They've kept kids from getting seriously ill. So again, we continue to urge parents and caregivers to please uh, get, get your kids started on the, the COVID vaccine as soon as possible. Next slide. Um, so you heard the governor talk about this last week. There's a lot of conversation in the media and really everywhere now about what does living with a virus look like? Phase two, managing the virus going forward. Um, and as I mentioned during the vaccination slides, and again, as, as is being discussed both on a state and national level, uh, we're going to have to figure out how to live with this virus. Um, we're, uh, I know it's hard for people and there's a lot of grief in this. We're not gonna go back to a time uh, like we had in 2019 where we, we had never heard of this. Um, the virus is with us. And frankly, how each of us lives with the virus is going to be different. It's gonna depend on our age, our health status, our family situation. Do we live with somebody who has a condition where they're immunocompromised? Do we have multi-generational households where you maybe have more vulnerable, older, uh, older family members living? It's also gonna depend on our risk tolerance. People um, in life, people have different risk tolerances for things. Some people like to bungee jump, some people I've been perfectly happy to, to retreat more to their couch over the last two years. Um, and most importantly, our response is gonna have to ebb and flow with the virus itself. Um, we are all hoping and praying that we don't see another variant like Delta or something as transmissible as Omicron, but the truth is we don't know. Um, we can hope and we can plan, um, but nobody can say with any certainty exactly what is gonna happen. And that's really been the case for the last two years. We have been responding to a highly mutating virus. We understand the frustration and people saying, oh, the guidance keeps changing, um, but it's changing and adapting again to keep pace with a virus that keeps throwing us curveballs um, and keeps surprising us um, with every twist and turn. And so the, the lesson and the thread throughout all of this is we need to keep reshaping our responses. Um, we need to keep individualizing them based on what we learn about risk to individual people, individual population. And we also need to be mindful of the tools we have. Um, again, as time has marched forward, we have so many more tools available to us, um, whether they're the monoclonal antibodies, the antivirals, um, better data about uh, quality of masks, uh, all of it. We are learning and when you know better, you do better. Um, and so at the point where we stand right now with de declining case counts, positivity rates, and hospitalizations, we can say that the risk is lower on a population level. The risk is lower today than it was in early January uh, when the governor referenced we were seeing 3,000 cases a day. Um, but again, the risk is different depending on the person. So on a statewide level, the risk might be lower but somebody who has cancer, who has multiple underlying conditions, um, somebody who's older, even in this period of our state doing better, they may still have more risk um, than somebody who doesn't have those conditions or is younger. So again, an important thing that we can all do, and you're gonna continue to hear us talking about it, even if it's not in a press conference setting, is really the vaccinations and the boosters. Um, having people be eligible and complete their series of vaccinations when they're available. And the reason for that is the science is clear. The vaccine significantly reduces the risk of severe disease 
because it prepares our immune systems to fight and face the virus when we encounter it in our communities or in our homes. And very importantly, again, with billions of people and over a million doses in Delaware uh, having been distributed, we know that these vaccines are safe. Um, they are safe and they are effective. And more importantly, and or maybe not more importantly, but equally as important and a credit to all of the many partners, whether they're the National Guard or the Dell Dot workers who have staffed vaccine sites to our clinicians, is these vaccines are available in every corner of our state um, right now. And obviously continue shout out to the Division of Public Health team and the DEMA teams uh, that continue to work on this every day, as well as our community partners. So in the meantime, again, we're gonna continue the medical community and the scientists and everyone are gonna to continue to gather more data. Healthcare providers are gonna to continue to gain access to therapeutics and things that can help us continue to live with the virus. And both we and the world at large are gaining more knowledge about uh, COVID-19, the virus that causes it, uh, SARS-CoV-2, as well as uh, what, type of, uh, what type of damage it can do uh, to people. But again, none of us know for certain what the future holds, and we all need to minimize the chances that we get or give the virus to others. And we also want to embrace moments, hopefully lasting moments, when the virus is in retreat, which again is what we're seeing right now. Um, so thank you, Governor. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Secretary McGarrick. Uh, again, thanks to your team, the team there at uh, Public Health, Dr. Attei just incredible work over the last uh, two years, uh, particularly again, once again, uh, in this winter surge as we had last year and uh, lots of stress among frontline workers. We appreciate uh, the work that we're doing. Clearly, all the data uh, tells us that we're moving into a new phase on the uh, governor's call with the White House this morning. All the governors were again looking to the future. Uh, what's next? How do we manage uh, this virus? How do we continue to keep our economies open, keep children in school, use the tools that we have. I mean, one of the really, really uh, simple things on our, uh, simple messages on our call this morning was we do have the tools. We have tools in terms of antivirals, all the different things that Secretary McGarrick talked about. We have the tools of the vaccines and the boosters. Uh, we have the tools in terms of the, uh, some of the science that we've learned. Uh, always through all this, our biggest priority has been uh, to keep children in schools when they were out, to get them back in school safely. We've been able to do that. We know that children are better off when they're in the classroom. Uh, and now uh, Dr. Haldick takes uh, his new challenges as Secretary of Education, working with his uh, former colleagues uh, and uh, uh, superintendent colleagues uh, to do just that, to keep children in school safely to make sure that they're learning, uh, to address some of the, the social emotional uh, challenges that they face. Really a lots of uh, difficult work for our, our educators, our teachers, our counselors, our administrators, principals across our state. Uh, Dr. Haldick, uh, thanks for joining our team uh, and thanks for working with our, all the superintendents and school boards and, and getting this right over the next month and a half. Certainly, thank you, Governor. I appreciate being here today. It is, it's been one month on the job and um, it's been a pleasure working with your team, Secretary McGarrick and many others um, from DPH, from the school districts that you just mentioned, specifically the, the superintendents, number of school board members I've been working with individually and collectively charter school leaders, educators, and, and lots of organizations <clears throat> I've gotten to know very well over the past month and around no topic more so um, than COVID-19 because it is our number one priority right now. And, um, and I imagine will be for some time, especially as we move toward this March 31st date. So as both Secretary McGarrick and the governor have um, shared and everyone is already aware based on last Monday's announcement. The mask requirement in our schools, K through 12, um, will be removed, the requirement for masks, um, on April 1st. So I think it's important to share with um, those in attendance today sort of where we are and what we're doing in preparation to support all of our schools in Delaware. 
as they prepare to make decisions um, when this state required mask removal is lifted. So I've been, as I just shared in lots of meetings, I would need more than my fingers and toes to count the number of meetings just in the last two weeks um, around this very topic. And um, I would point to my meeting with the school chiefs on Thursday, February 3rd, and then soon after the charter leads, um, where we talked through um, the timeline for a potential lifting of the statewide mass mandate. While at the time we didn't have a date selected, we were, we were soliciting feedback from, from our school leaders and then other leaders and other organizations who are doing work in our schools. And pleased to say that the governor and his team uh, heard that message and um, this March 31st date I am very comfortable with as secretary. Because what I heard from um, those various leaders, in particular the superintendents, was we need a little bit of time to prepare for this. Time so that our students, our families can make decisions around getting their children, our students, vaccinated. The governor and Secretary McGarrick covered some recent events. Um, this past Saturday, Cape Henlopen High School partnered with Aspira Health and had a, a vaccination event at at the high school um, where my two daughters received their booster shots. And uh, I saw the number of people going through, which um, was very positive and uplifting. I, I will emphasize just as uh, the secretary and governor did, it is uh, the most critical and um, important way for us to prepare for this uh, March 31st date. It is get your children vaccinated. It puts us in the best possible position as masks are likely to be lifted. Now I say that and want to um, just remind everyone that it's a statewide lifting of the mandate. It doesn't necessarily mean that every school and district will lift um, or make the decision to lift a mandate in their own schools. I'm gonna talk about that in just a bit. But going back to the March 31st date, um, it also gives school districts time to make their own decisions around what they want to do with local masking. And I think playing into that decision will be the guidance that we provide schools and districts in regard to issues such as contact tracing and quarantining, um, other mitigation strategies that we'll suggest and provide as recommendations. Um, and that will help school districts make a localized decision based on what's best for them. So things that might come into consideration could be current vaccination rates in their own communities. Uh, as the governor uh, indicated, we have some communities that have much higher vaccination rates than others. That could play a role in helping a, a school board make a decision around what they want to do with masking or other mitigating strategies that they might want to employ to decrease the chances of spread within, within their schools. So between now and then, you know, I mentioned all of these meetings that have been happening, they will continue. Uh, so it is small and medium as well as large group meetings that are being held between the Department of Ed and other groups and these school leaders to help place them in the position where they um, will receive guidance and be best prepared for it so that they can hold school board meetings where they can take action to make decisions on what they're gonna do come April 1st. At the end of the day, we want to keep children safely in schools. That's what this has been about and continues to be about. Um, we believe that when children are in school around one another in the most normalized uh, climate and atmosphere possible, they thrive. So we've received lots of concerns and feedback here at the department around um, social emotional health and you know what students have been through. And on occasion, people will say caused by masks and I kind of flip that and say less about masks, more about opportunities that kids have missed out on um, in terms of being able to 
be around one another and, and hold the kind of activities, participate in things that they otherwise would have. So we have an opportunity here if we really work collaboratively to get this right come April 1st, lift uh, the statewide mass mandate, do what's appropriate at the local level, which puts districts and schools in the very best possible situation to keep kids there. That is critically important. One, la <clears throat> one last topic I'd like to talk about uh, before turning it back over to the governor is my excitement around the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. So I, I, I know that the governor is, has shared out some information previously about, about this initiative and how important it is to him. And I just wanna share with everyone that as secretary, it's, it's incredibly important to me. Similar to the governor, I have a personal connection to this work, having been a product of the Brandywine School District, lived through DSEG. Um, I've seen all too well the consequences of uh, efforts that don't succeed to improve outcomes for kids. And we have an opportunity here through this collaborative effort between the Brandywine, Red Clay, and Christina School Districts to make positive change for our students and families, specifically those who attend school, elementary and middle school in the city of Wilmington. It was a big week for us last week because on Monday night last week, the Brandywine School Board voted unanimously to enter into conversations to get an MOU signed um, that would put planning in place to support those schools and students in those communities. And then on Wednesday night, the Red Clay School uh, Board followed with a unanimous supportive vote, seven to zero, to also uh, move into negotiations around an MOU. Folks have asked me why I feel so strongly about, about the Wilmington Learning Collaborative, because I think it's, it's been far too long, too many conversations, very positive um, intentions that just haven't moved forward. And now we are finally finding ourselves in a place where we're gonna work together to change the opportunities and outcomes for our students and families who for far too long, pretty much since the inception of desegregation, in Wilmington have been left behind. Uh, putting, connecting our schools with community-based organizations, faith-based organizations to really employ, uh, deploy rather, uh, wraparound services that meet the needs of, our, of the whole student, the whole child uh, in their own communities. And so you're gonna be hearing much more about this. This is work that uh, I will be directly involved in. On the slide that you're looking at, it includes uh, times when the governor himself canvassed communities in the city and went door knocking. You're aware that there have been, at this point, far more than 100 meetings held. And um, the, the lion's share of those meetings, led by John Sheehan and Jim Simmons and the governor himself, I've been fortunate. I've come in the last four weeks and um, have had the pleasure of seeing the fruits of that labor come together with these, with these um, board votes. So I'm excited about that work and just felt um, that it needed to be mentioned before turning it back over to the governor. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Holodick. Uh, welcome to the team again. I know you've been working for, for over a month uh, already came up big uh, as the closure there for uh, our approval with Brandywine Red Clay School Boards. Special thanks there to Link Holler at Brandywine, John Scrobot and members of the board, uh, Darrell Green, superintendent over at Red Clay, Kathy Thompson and, and the members of the board for, for their votes and for the expected uh, collaboration that we're gonna have over the next uh, several months and years uh, to make improvements there. We do uh, one last slide here. Uh, promoting everyone getting your booster if you haven't had it already. First of all, get fully vaccinated. We want to climb those ranks, get up there with the top tier of states in terms of percentage vaccinated and, and boosted. Uh, we know this will, these are really important as we try to manage the virus going forward, keep our children in school, keep our businesses open. We have a real opportunity now as we get into the uh, late uh, winter months, into the spring, uh, and uh, turn the page a little bit uh, on the old phase into this new phase. And it's one where better times are ahead. So uh, 
Thank you all for joining us. I know we have uh, some members of the media that have, uh, are with us again. We appreciate your attendance, uh, getting the information out to the public that's so important uh, in our efforts to manage, uh, manage this virus. So we uh, appreciate it and we look forward to your questions. All right, Governor, the first question is going to come from Meredith Newman of the News Journal. Hi there, I have a couple questions regarding the Delaware National Guard. Um, Governor or Senator McGarrick, or Secretary McGarrick, sorry. Um, are there any metrics that the state is looking at regarding the impact that the um, Guard is having on hospitals and nursing homes in terms of decompressing those facilities? Well, I could tell you what the objectives uh, were and are, and I'll turn it over to Secretary McGarrick. First and foremost, was to help the hospitals decompress. When they hit that peak of 759 on January the 12th and the lead up, the run up to that, they were really under the gun. And they, not only were the number of positive cases rising across our state, we hit over 3,000, we're down to 350, 350 uh, yesterday, seven day moving average, but they had their own employees that were out and affected and testing positive. And so they were short, handed on that end uh, under the surge on, on the other end. Across the state, Christiana Care, St. Francis, the VA, uh, Nemours, uh, Bay Health, uh, Tidal Health, and BB. Uh, actually, Dr. Tam from BB recommended that we call up the guard for non-clinical support, uh, something that he did in, uh, in the Navy Reserve out in California. And so we Ran that up the uh, up the chain of command and got uh, approval to do that. Took that action right away. Immediately, uh, we heard positive comments back from the hospitals about that. But fundamentally, it was about a, a neighbor. Then we had a whole group, almost a hundred, that were trained as CNAs to go into the long-term care facilities to provide them the support, so that we could so the hospitals could discharge patients from their hospital settings into uh, into the long-term care facilities. And so uh, the objective was to reduce those numbers, push them down. I got to tell you, I was um, pretty adamant about that, wanted to see real numbers. And it took a day or two, but they ultimately started headed in the right direction. In terms of specific measures, um, the measure for me was the reduction in those, in those numbers and to, to see reports back about increased the discharges into those units. Now, whether or not we can uh, draw a straight line cause and effect, uh, I'll refer that to Secretary McGarrick and her reflections. Thanks, Governor, and hello, Meredith. Uh, so you're right, Governor, the key metric that we've been watching has been the hospitalization number in terms of success of the program. And then like Secretary Holiday said, with respect to the uh, the discussions with schools, we've been having frequent communications with the health systems as well as the long-term care facilities to understand the situation on the ground and to figure out, are, are they not taking discharges? Why are they not taking discharges? And that was really why these two, uh, these two deployments of National Guards members were created. Um, again, as the governor said, because we were hearing that there was staff out sick. Um, we were also hearing that there was trouble discharging and uh, in addition to just uh, trying to make sure that the hospitals are able to have enough bed capacity, no one wants someone to be in a, in a hospital longer than they have to. And many of these individuals um, who needed to go to long-term care needed a different level of care um, than the acute setting. And so this was an important partnership to also make sure that uh, individuals coming out of the hospitals who needed to be at long-term care facilities receiving that next level of care, whether it be rehab, or um, other skilled nursing were able to successfully get there um, and to not have these facilities say, I'm sorry, we can't take you because frankly, we don't have the staff to safely provide the care. And I know for some guard members, um, the requirement to get vaccinated doesn't, uh, the deadline isn't until this summer. Is that a factor in terms of how many members you deploy into certain areas or was the number of people that are in these different facilities not affected by how many were available due to the vaccine requirement, who has gotten it and who hasn't? I don't know about the vaccine requirement, but clearly we had a number of guards, men and women 
who tested positive in the run up to their deployment, right? And so we're, when I said 100, that was the target. I think at one point it was down to like the mid 70s to 80 because uh, members were, had tested positive. Secretary McGarrett. I was going to say exactly what you said, Governor. Really, when we were talking to the long-term care facilities, the challenges that they were having around discharges was very similar to what we heard from the hospitals. It was staff and team members who were out sick themselves with COVID. And so it wasn't that there wasn't a physical bed available for somebody, but it was, do they have the, the personnel, um, the clinicians, the CNAs, the nursing, whatever um, the specific case may be, but those individuals um, were out due to the Omicron surge. Uh, and so that was, again, really the matchmaking was done to say, well, what are facilities that have beds that could offer them up if we could say we could bring you know, five guards members or whatever the case may be. And so there was a lot of intentional conversations with both the health systems uh, and long-term care, as well as the guard to really make bed capacity available. Got it, thank you. Thanks, Meredith. Our next question comes from Cody Decker of WRDE. Cody says, with the at-home COVID tests being sent by the federal government, is there a way people can report a positive result so it can count towards the state data? Or do you recommend people get another test at a site to confirm the positive result and count towards the state's numbers? I'll defer that to Secretary McGarrick. Thanks, Governor, and, and thanks for the question. And I think this is, it, it's really important. And the at-home testing are a very, uh, again, important tool in our toolbox uh, in terms of helping individuals understand the risk that they pose to others, especially in a situation where they may be going to visit somebody who's immunocompromised or uh, an elderly relative that if that person was exposed and became positive, they're at higher risk for serious outcomes. Uh, so throughout this entire pandemic, we know that we have not been able to capture every single positive case in our data, uh, but we've captured a significant number and it's really helped us to identify the trends of when cases are increasing um, and when, again, the position we're in now where the cases are starting to wane um, and percent positivity. So. Uh, Really, the, the goal of this has not been to capture every single positive case out there. We want to capture as many as we can uh, to be able to understand the trends and to see where the data is going. And so while, um, yes, we understand that, that people wish there was an opportunity to report these positive cases, there isn't, but that doesn't mean that they don't serve a very important function. Um, and for those that, that have a positive test and want to confirm it, um, that is where, again, our community testing options through Curative come into effect. And again, if they need that positive uh, test through Curative um, to get on a plane or to not get on a plane, as the case may be, um, we still want to have those options. So it's really a both and versus an either or. Um, and again, a, a very important toolkit for helping individuals um, understand their risks to others and hopefully choose to, to stay home and isolate if they get that positive home test. Our next question is going to come from Tim Mastro of the Delaware State News. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Hi Tim. I want to ask a little bit about the mask mandate um, in state buildings. I'm sure you saw Governor Hogan in Maryland is ending theirs uh, next week. What's going to be the status of Delaware's moving forward and kind of your thought process around that? Yeah, I did see that this morning. Governor Hogan uh, made that announcement. So one of the things we've tried to keep in touch uh, across our borders with Governor Hogan, Governor Wolf and Governor Murphy, just to kind of understand what the region's looking like and what they're doing. And and how it affects us. It is certainly we'll continue. We will continue to evaluate. We have uh, state facilities that are very different, have very diff different risk profiles. To go to Secretary McGarrick's point about uh, how to manage uh, the virus in the future, we have prisons with congregate settings and youth detention centers, which uh, require uh, a certain extra level of attention when it comes to keeping the, the virus out of their facilities. I know 
that the commissioner has uh, a plan to reopen the facilities. It's also important that that the inmates uh, have visitors, and and that's a, an area of concern. So we'll we'll continue to look at that. Public transit. A number of our facilities are, um, you know, under the requirements of the federal government. So long-term care facilities, uh, healthcare facilities, public transportation. Uh, we have a lot of facilities that require direct public contact uh, uh, with, uh, with state employees, and we will pay special attention to that. But we'll continue to evaluate it, Tim, uh, as the, the cases continue to, to plummet, hopefully, uh, and make good decisions appropriately with the risk profile of, of, uh, of state institutions. Our focus, primary focus will be on updating our guidance for the school districts and working with them to keep children in school safely. All right, thank you. Thanks, Tim. All right, and our last question uh, was a pre-submitted question from uh, Chris Barish. And Governor, this is for you. Um, there was recently a letter sent around by members of the Delaware Republican House uh, calling for an end to some of the pandemic related restrictions. Uh, do you have any comment reaction to this letter? Yeah, I've not seen the letter yet, but uh, we've tried hard over the last two years to keep open lines of communications with all legislators, uh, Democratic and Republican. I know that when we have a significant announcement that we mostly make on these uh, weekly press conferences. We give legislators and other elected officials a heads up so that they're not caught uh, by surprise. Uh, we try to share information about uh, the work that we're doing with school districts because each of those legislatures, uh, legislators has a school district and schools in their community and they hear from parents obviously about all of that. We've tried to work with them with uh, to share information about uh, the, how the data reflects uh, their individual districts, what their uh, case rates are like, what the vaccination rates are, are, are like uh, in their districts. And some of those districts actually have lower vaccination rates than other parts of our state. So we try to focus on the need to, to uh, improve those. So I'll take a look at the letter and, and we'll continue to work uh, with members of, of the uh, party on the other side to, to do the best for all Delawareans. We don't, uh, when it comes to COVID, uh, there's no D's or R's or I's. Everybody's a Delawarean and we're trying to protect each and every one, use consistent data. I will say that Democrat and Republican governors have worked uh, very closely together uh, over the last two years uh, as through the National Governors Association. And we ask kind of some of the same questions of the White House, first the Republican White House, now Democratic White House, with the objective of uh, protecting our our communities, protecting the people, uh, the people in our individual states, recognizing that the federal government provides national guidance and we deliver and manage uh, at the state uh, and local level. So we'll continue to do that uh, with members of the General Assembly. So that was the last question, was it? Yep, that was the last pre-submitted question. That was the last question. And this is the last press conference uh, for the time being as we move into this new phase. Uh, it's a better phase. Obviously, our numbers are drop, dropping like a rock uh, in terms of the number of positive cases, the percent of tests that are positive. We're not where we want to be. We still have a little ways to go there. Uh, we've got some work to do with our school superintendents and school staff and, and, uh, and board uh, school boards over the next uh, uh, end of this month and the next month till the end of, of March. Uh, obviously, they'll have board meetings, I, I suspect, before that. And as Secretary McGarrick says, we have the tools. Uh, we know what the situation is. We'll continue to monitor that. And you can monitor the data yourselves on our website, de.gov slash coronavirus. You can get just about any, any information that you need in terms of vaccines, uh, therapeutics, uh, the, the uh, prevalence of COVID in, in your uh, community. Uh, we'll have the, the school board or the school uh, guidance up when when we've developed it and we'll continue to communicate with you in other ways. So thanks again to Secretary McGarrick, uh, Secretary Hobzik for what you do in your respective agencies. We look forward to getting better every day. Thanks for joining us.